Ah, well, thank you. And I do like being described as terrific. Um, well, to say a lot has happened in the last matter of weeks is an absolute understatement. We've had a new prime minister. We've got tax on the agenda or perhaps a, a tax grab back firmly on the agenda. Very tentative signs in the economy. And of course, the wild card is China. So with all those things in mind, I'd like to ask the panel what they think is the key economic challenge and if they've got a solution. So David, you're on the end. Do you want to start? <laughs> What's your um, take? I might start with the, uh, the challenges and then come up with the solutions. Mm. I think as you just pointed out, uh, both Australia and, and the global economy, it's got uh, a lot to think about. Whether you're a government policy maker or whether you're the head of a, um, a um, you know, a corporate entity, uh, you, you're trying to um, focus on have the traditional ways you've been doing business going to work going forward. We've got technology as a disruptor and, and as an opportunity for, uh, for most organisations to think about. So, you know, I don't think it's all that bad. Um, so I think the challenge is uh, whilst we are in a, uh, you know, a low interest rate, low growth environment, um, real estate's probably a sector that's going to continue to prosper in that environment. And, um, you know, every second day there's, uh, you know, speculation of, you know, when the Fed is going to lift uh, rates, when in reality, uh, even if they do, it's going to be relatively modest to start with. So uh, I think the, you know, the, the general uh, complexity of issues that are facing both the global economy and the Australian economy um, are going to continue for the next uh, couple of years, but it's not going to uh, prevent uh, the property sector continuing to prosper. And obviously there'll be sectors that are going to have, um, you know, price uh, gyrations that are uh, not in sync with the, with the other sectors. And, and I think for, for Australia, we are transitioning um, from, you know, the mining boom uh, reasonably well, a lot, a lot better than a lot of people thought we would. So I think the outlook is, uh, is reasonably good, even though there's uh, obviously a complexity of issues to think about. Steve, are you, are you seeing challenges and solutions? Yes, look, I, I agree with everything that's already been said. I'd add that um, certainly the business community's reaction to Malcolm Turnbull's appointment has been quite encouraging. And I think the agenda around tax reform is a necessary one. If you've got state budgets where 50% of their spending is on healthcare and education, it's inevitable that you have to have some kind of broad-based tax reform. So we're supportive of that. Obviously, in the property sector, we have our own um, specific areas of interest, and there are, you know, there's a real need to push for further productivity in Australia, and there are, there are some taxes like stamp duty which is really a tax on mobility, which um, drives inefficiency. So I think looking at those sorts of reforms are important long-term decisions for, for the government to, to be making. I think they've got the right agenda. Mm. Do, you, do you think though the government sees uh, the property market as a, a soft target and there'll be a tax grab? Look, I think the, um, in every country, and certainly in Australia, fairness is, is a big issue. and. Uh, there's been a lot of talk around potential value capture through sequestering property mm. taxes, land taxes, stamp duty, whatever they may be. My own perspective on that is that's fine so long as, again, it's a broad approach to industry in general. So mm. if there are super profits being made in one sector, uh, I fail to see how it's fair for, for that sector not to be taxed if you're going to tax property more aggressively. So I think there needs to be a real broad assessment of how you drive tax reform in a number of different areas. Mm. And Louise, what do you think on that issue? I think um, the intergenerational report talked about the need for broad tax reform, but it was mm. also very, very firm on the fact that that shouldn't be targeted at the property industry. And there are a lot of good reasons in that as to why. I think in terms of sort of the broad economic challenges that we're facing, it it's, can be summed up as we're only about halfway through the, the post mining boom. Um, and it's all about focusing on productivity growth. But but like David said, there's a lot of reasons to be positive. We've mm -hmm. got borrowing rates at generational lows. We've got the fall in the Australian dollar, which is really positive for manufacturing, education, tourism. 
Uh, we've got lower petrol prices than we had this time last year. We'd all like them lower, but you know, they are still lower than last year. Um, so there's a lot of reasons, and, and we're, we're still um, saving as, as an organiser, as a, as a country. So there's a lot of reasons to actually be positive, and, and I think it's a, it's a balance out of the positives and negatives, and there, there should be no, no dramatics or no real worries about where we are in the economy at the moment. Mm. But there certainly is need, I think, at all levels of government to be focused on that, that growth for us. Mm. And we've, had a, we've obviously had a change of Prime Minister. Is Malcolm Turnbull making the right noises, Darren? Oh, look, it's still very early days. I mean, mm. I think if you go back over the last, what, three or four, or, or is it five now, changes of mm. Prime Minister, they always have this sort of honeymoon period. I think, you know, as Steve said, the early signs are encouraging, mm -hmm. but, you know, the jury's out and uh, let's see how he performs. Mm. Well, we also have a cities minister. That's not something we've had federally. Mm. And we haven't had emphasis on cities federally for probably 50 years, if, it, if, if at all. Uh, do you think that that's going to make a difference, Steve? It's actually hard to hear your, your mic, Tori, up here, oh, so okay. could you repeat the question? Maybe I'll just have to yell. Yeah. Um, it's bouncing. It's bouncing. Um, will a city minister and a federal level make a difference? So, um, look, that's one thing we're very encouraged by. Jamie Briggs understands infrastructure. He's had mm -hmm. a, a good exposure to that space. He's very pro-business in the exposures we've had, the interactions we've had with him. Um, and he's very energetic, so I think that they are important ingredients for somebody <coughs> to step into that space. We've got to bear in mind that um, under the Labor government, it's been attempted on a number of different occasions, and, and really the interaction with the business community and having a clear understanding of the importance of cities and what drives good cities and good urban growth is a critical part of, of that working. And getting good cooperation between federal and state governments will be probably the most challenging part of that, but um, yeah. it's still a very good initiative in our opinion. Mm. I mean, Lewis, what do you think? I mean, the power lies with the states, and yet we've got this infrastructure issue, and now we've got a federal cities minister. It does. Well, I think, I think there's a spread between all three levels of government, local, state, and federal. I think Ken Morrison actually summed it up in his article in The Australian. So I've got brownie points mentioning Ken and the Property Council and for mentioning The Australian Absolutely. last week. Um, Ken wrote a great article on the future of our cities, and I think he made a really valid point. It's going to be about doing a deal between all levels of government, and that's something that Jamie Breeze can step into. Uh, in the past, we've either had local and state or state and federal. We haven't had all three linked together. We can have a debate about do we need all three in Australia, but I think his job can be one of trying to mediate between all three levels of government to try and get outcomes in relation to infrastructure, in relation to growth, in relation to giving us livable cities in the future. When you look at Australia's population is tipped to double by 2054. So there's a hell of a lot we need to do to make our cities livable and to cope with that growth between now and then. So if we don't get our act together between the three levels of government, I think then there's, there's certainly an issue. Mm, OK, we'll give Louise all the nice questions instead of brownie points after that. But also, could I remind everyone if they'd like to text a question, to send a question in, there is also roving microphones here. So if anyone's got questions for the panellists, please feel free to ask and help me along. Um, should we, should we turn to the property markets? Because I think that's what a lot of people are absolutely wanting to know from you guys, is where is the market sitting? You know, we've had the RBA financial stability report last week. There's a lot to talk about in that. And really, you know, they're warning over both commercial and pockets of residential. Is it a minute to midnight, Darren? <laughs> I think it's really interesting. I'll just helicopter up for a second, because um, I was up in Asia, would have been four to five weeks ago, and it was... It was fascinating. First time in 12 years, each of those discussions, there would have been probably 16 to 20 discussions with international investors, and the fear factor with regard to China, the impact on Australia was huge. I think every single investor was saying, oh, gee, you guys are about to have a rough, rocky road down there. And as a result, they were questioning their investments into, into our country. Now, that's a total disconnect to really what's happening on the ground. And you, and you get back into the ground and you see you know, the leasing markets across office, industrial and, and retail in the eastern seaboard, at least, are, are quite positive, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne. You, the retail's been consistent, retail sales are up, and so there's this huge disconnect between what's, what's happening. Um, I think when you, when you then say, you know, is, are we one minute to midnight, you look at the different costs of capital that different investors have, and 
So listed companies may not have the sharpest cost of capital, and we're seeing assets continually bid down to very, very low cap rates. So I think to sum all that up, I suppose my view is it's not 10 minutes to midnight. It differs on different asset classes and different markets. But I'd say for, you know, let's talk about Sydney and Melbourne, office, retail and industrial, I'd say we've got two to three years to run in this cycle because, as David said, I can't see interest rates in this country going anywhere in a hurry. So, David, do you think then, I mean, we're seeing some activity that you, you'd think is top of the market. We're seeing some of the privates sell out, seeing more IPOs, perhaps more mergers. You know, what's your view on whether it's a minute to midnight? Look, I think uh, you've heard it all, mm. all morning. You know, we're in a global world. Capital mm. uh, is being priced globally. And the reason why uh, we've gone from roughly 10% offshore uh, investment, around $30 billion of transactions, over $5 million each year, and it's now heading towards about 35% uh, or 40% of total transactions on the last 12 months uh, from offshore uh, capital. That's going to continue. Uh, if you go to uh, any of the other mature, transparent Western markets, uh, like for like cap rates uh, in London, in gateway cities in the US, uh, in, in Asian uh, large cities, they're at 150 to 200 basis points lower cap rates in Australia. Mm -hmm. And people forget that the 10 year bond rate in Australia is only 50 bips above the US treasuries. So that's, that's the first time uh, we've really seen Australian bond yields move towards uh, the US. Um, so, you know, my view is that, as Darren said, um, whether uh, we think it's, there's a disconnect between occupier or, or rental fundamentals and cap rates, um, it's a supply and demand situation and we've, we're going to see cap rates continue to catch up. That we, they, they have not fallen as much as the cost of debt has fallen. It's as simple as that. And they have in other parts of the world. So Australia is in catch up mode. We will need rebound in, in occupier demand to drive rents to sustain any sort of cap rate compression further. Um, but I think we've probably, um, across most of the sectors, looking at least 50 to 75 basis point compression over the next couple of years. And that's really just to bring us in line with alternatives. And as I said earlier, if you're a, a Chinese insurance company, sovereign wealth fund, uh, you, one of the Middle Eastern uh, uh, sovereigns, uh, or even for the first time in this country, North American pension capital. We've seen the Canadians for some time, but North American pension funds um, and insurance companies coming into the Australian real estate market, you know, you, they, they see a lot of relative value. So, uh, and I, I don't buy the, uh, you know, Australia's going into a recession. So I think uh, we are in good shape. Um, there will, we've been doing this for 30 years, that we will have a cycle, it will peak, it will, you know, trough. The real question is, are we going to have, when we eventually do peak, is it going to be a soft, plateau type uh, levelling out, or is there going to be some sharp correction? And traditionally, sharp corrections are driven by the evaporation of the spread of yield to debt. And I really can't see how we're going to see a V-shaped recovery in bond yields. Uh, we, we, you know, global, globally, central banks respond to inflation. And until inflation starts going above 3% in this country, it's really hard to see the Reserve Bank lifting rates in any meaningful way. Well, David and Darren, you're basically saying then we're going to see another wave of money coming in, and I presume the low dollar will feed into that. Absolutely. I think, you know, it wasn't that long ago we were at parity. It wasn't that long ago we were at, you know, 90 cents, so we're now in the sort of early to mid-70s, and that's encouraging more and more capital, notwithstanding, uh, you know, uh, the comments Darren made about people concerned about the impact of China, uh, I think in a relative sense, Australia is, uh, is uh, extremely good value and at 70 or 75 cents, and if it drops into the 60s, there'll be even more capital mm. flowing. I think it was really interesting. That most of the comments I got on were from listed investors, but then you look at the unlisted market, in the last four weeks, we've had offers on properties from Koreans that haven't invested here before, from German pension funds that are coming back in in a relatively big way, local uh, institutions, privates and US companies. Mm -hmm. So it just goes to that uh, globalisation of the Australian market where before you go back five to ten years, you might have had these groups in one sort of one batch and then another. 
but now we have them you know, in Globo down here looking, you know, looking for a reasonable investment. And Steve, are you saying this? Um, Darren's saying the market's got a couple more years to run commercial property. What do you think? And Louise, I'd be interested in your view too. Yeah, look, I think the, um, you know, it's hard to pick a cycle, obviously, mm. and what investors tend to look for is a catalyst. And uh, if you go back 10 years, the discussion or debate was around whether China could ever decouple from the US. And if you look today, China is a, big, is a bigger driver of the global economy than the US in terms of the reactions to movements in China, slowdown, change of policy, whatever it will be. So there's no doubt that the market's reacting to that China catalyst, and they're predicting that to be the thing that slows down both the broader Australian economy, which it will do, and the property industry. But I think the comments around fundamentals are very valid. There's no doubt there's, there's plenty of, of room for further movement in Australia when you just look at the, the bond spread. We're obviously also in the residential market. The residential market has been obviously attractive to foreign buyers as well. And one of the questions that we've had you know, a lot of focus on is settlement risk, in particular from mainland Chinese buyers. And again, when you look at fundamentals, that reaction's been overdone. When we look at our book, settlements from mainland Chinese buyers that are due to settle post June 17 represent about 10% of our book. And anyone who fails to settle between now and June 17 is leaving behind a 20% currency adjustment and a probably a 10 to 20% price increase. So hard to see how those early settlements are really at risk and the later settlements are not a big proportion of our book and I would suggest of the broad residential industry in Australia. So the far bigger issue for us all to think about on the resi market is local rules, APRA regulations, bank lending um, being tightened in the investor market. That, in my opinion, is more relevant than the China settlement risk and the fact is we're in a low interest rate environment. We've got very good employment statistics emerging and I don't see a significant uh, downturn risk emerging. I see perhaps the residential market having plateaued mm -hmm. and that may be the case for the next couple of years. But talks of major price corrections, I struggle to get my mind around. Mm.